right, hello and welcome to the On Stage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller, and with me is arts reporter Tony Tresca. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Good morning, Alex. Going pretty good. How about yourself? Very well, thanks. Yeah, we're recording on the morning of November 18th on this Saturday. So you and I both saw a show last night at the Buell Denver Center. It was Hip Hop Nutcracker. Uh, certainly, it's not your grandma's nutcracker. As I heard somebody say as I was walking out of the theater, they were like, that was fun, but that's not the nutcracker. We still have to go see the other one. Because um, it's certainly, it's, a, it's its own thing. I, uh-huh. It's its own experience. I It's basically like break break dancing plus divorce plus nutcracker. Uh-huh. Yeah, there, so there's, uh, there's definitely some of the, you know, the original Tchaikovsky, I mean, quite a bit of the original, the ballet and... Um, then, and then there's a lot of, you know, hip hop dancing instead of ballet. And, and it starts off with a little bit of, there was an MC, his name is Curtis Blow, who apparently is well known in hip hop circles, at least to, uh, some people. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was a fun night. We, we left a little bit, you know, after kind of the curtain, you know, the curtain calls and, you know, all, all that, uh, Curtis Blow came back on and they were doing a lot of hip hop stuff, which, you know, my wife and I are just like, you know, not big hip hop fans. So we were like, okay, that's, that's enough of that. But yeah, that was fair. Uh, after it was kind of fun. They all came out. They, I, the viol, the, there was a really incredible, uh, person who was playing the violin. She came out and. She came out again and she had an incredible uh, killer final solo during that extended curtain call that honestly it made it whole really worth it. And I don't know, they did more, I, they did more flips in that final curtain call than I had ever than they did in the rest of the show too. So I don't know. Some of the the spectacle of it was, it was cool. I honestly, I, I I actually, I I think the first act to kind of, and I think this maybe was just a more of a general nutcracker problem, is the first act that's kind of a little bit confusing, but the second act, once they just get into the fun of the, like, we're going to show off the dancing, and uh, and they kind of integrated, they had this, like, added plot on top of it of, like, the girl's parents are kind of maybe going to split up, but they rekindle their love, and I don't know. It kind of worked for me. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Un- unfortunately, uh, by the time you hear this, it will probably be gone. It was only uh, here uh, on, there's only, uh, I think, two more shows today. So, uh, so it'll be gone. So you'll have to turn to the more traditional nutcrackers. So, uh, so there was that. Um, so coming up, we'll review some of the latest shows that we've seen uh, and or reviewed, as well as take a look at what's coming up around the state uh, on stage. And then later in the podcast, this uh, we have an interview that you did, Tony, with Brian Malgrave from the Arvada center uh in uh where you talked about his many years as a scenic director in the theater and what else uh can you tease that a little bit more yeah absolutely so he's the scenic been the resident scenic designer uh over at the center for 17 years now uh, we kind of have just a lively conversation about the art of scenic design he just recently came back from a trip uh to new york so we kind of get his takes on some of the scenic designs he saw up there. And then we also kind of just discuss his, some of his previous work, uh, particularly for the last couple of seasons and tease uh, his work on Cinderella, which opens on November 24th. Uh, which, and that sounds like it's, I was actually just over in the center earlier this week at, for an interview I was doing with Kenny Moten, who's the director of that. And I got a chance to look at the set and it is just splendid. They've complete. it's very, it's, starkly minimalistic they've got this clock in the middle that's going to be a a, oh my gosh a revolve uh and they've got this really cool plexiglass kind of uh background stuff that they're doing really cool star projection stuff on too that you're just gonna have to see it to believe so it's a cool conversation yeah scenic design is uh that is just such a really just a neat part of theater and building that world the visual world is is uh, something that sometimes i'm just amazed at what people think up you know one of the other things that we were talking about um, a little bit was um was uh, programs and uh, you know so theater programs you know i can still remember when i was going to broadway shows in new york city back when i was a kid you know the playbill was the original um thing and and uh and when the pandemic hit, a lot of people, you know, once theater did start coming back, people they sort of did away with paper programs. And then all of a sudden we were looking at QR codes and everybody was like, I don't like this. <laughs> so, but I mean, I think it's, you know, you watch uh, a lot of programs wind up under the seats that, you know, maybe they get recycled. They, you know, I, I think there's a lot of waste that goes along with them when they're in print, but uh, I don't know. What's, what's your take on programs? Do we need them? Who uses them? I, I guess, I guess I'm maybe a bit of a, 
a little bit old school in this fashion as I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the, of the physical programs. I think they're one of the things that you can, that a theater can kind of give back to its patrons. I'm personally, I think maybe I'm the target person who likes to collect them. I'm a big theater fan. I have behind me all, all of the programs from all the shows, just like listed there. Oh my God. I, it's, Do you have all your ticket stubs? Too? I, I, when, when are ticket stubs? I get more and more <laughs> tickets. Um, in, on that are digital now a day. Yeah. So, but when I do get, when I do get physical ticket stubs, like uh, the Arvada center always gives out physical tickets, for instance, I keep all of those. Yeah. They're right up there over there. So yeah, I, I don't know. I think that there is some sentimental value and there is, there's value in treating theater like a full experience. And I think that this is one other part of that. I definitely hear the arguments for it because against it, excuse me, uh, in terms of like the waste argument you were just saying, we're at the, we were at the Buell last night and I walked past so many just like discarded programs and the DCPA for, does these big magazine spread programs. So those are, these are glossy programs. I would imagine that those are probably, these are probably, they cost not, maybe not a ton to print, but this is more than like just going to your print shop and doing like a 50, a 50 cent program or something. This is, this is a more substantial investment than that. So I see why the necessity of like they having the recycling program, which they do as well at the Denver Center, for instance. But I don't know. I think I, I like the sentimental value of a program. Yeah, I would say I'm, I'm kind of more pro paper program in general. Of course, you know, the Denver Center program, they sell a fair amount of advertising. And, you know, all programs have a little bit of advertising, but mostly it's like, you know, Ernie's furniture shop that happens to be next to the theater and I gave him 50 bucks for it. Whereas at Denver center ads, I'm sure it costs quite a bit and, and probably offset the, the, that expense uh, a fair amount. But uh, yeah, um, I, I kind of, so when you're sitting there in the theater, it's like, there's, there's some things you might want to, you might want to look at the cast and who the director was and some of those, some of those folks, but you know, Denver center always has these fairly long feature articles that, you know, you're not, you'd be hard pressed to sit there and read it. Uh, you know, in the few minutes you have before the show, especially if you're there with somebody. Uh, so, you know, that's something you would, you might read when you get home. And I occasionally look at those. Um, sometimes, you know, it helps with writing a review. There's a little bit of background in there uh, about shows. So, yeah, I, I think that there, I think that there's real value. There is some value in like treating it more of like how the Denver center does and where it's, it's your kind of, ticket to some more theater news as well. It is more of like a magazine rather than just a, here's a fact sheet of the cast and their bios and or the artistic team. Yeah. And it also gives the, those programs are loaded with uh, upcoming shows, not just the Denver center, but a lot of the other big theater companies advertise in there. So you can get a, uh, a look ahead at, at what's coming up. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and there's also the kind of, I guess you would call it sort of a hybrid where they give you sort of a abbreviated program. Maybe it's just one or two pages and then there's a QR code to more detail on, on, you know, uh, the digital site. So you're holding up something there. What's that one? I, I have an example. I'm just going to talk about this. And I, since I knew we were talking programs, that is exactly what Curious Theater does now. They've kind of met they kind of met in the middle, uh, I guess, in which they still give you these kind of more of a, it's, it's printed on, I guess, just kind of like regular paper. Like this honestly just looks like office paper, like our cardstock or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and they printed all the names of the cast and the settings and stuff. And then they previewed what's upcoming next. But then, yeah, they just have QR codes to the full playbill and other information about it, which I think is I think it meets that. It's kind of meeting in the middle. It's giving you that souvenir kind of thing and also that ticket to more information. But yeah, it does lose out on the advertising ability and kind of like the community building kind of aspect that a program, I think, does allow theaters to sometimes be able to do. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, in, in the world of magazines or programs or newspapers, any print information has, you know, has moved a lot to digital. You know, I mean, I had a really hard time when I finally canceled my subscription to the print version of the Denver Post, which was like the one last print thing I was getting. And I was just like, I just wasn't looking at it. You know, I was like, I, I have a subscription to it online, but I just, you know, and I, I do miss that. I used to love like, you know, spreading out the paper in the morning and, uh, but it's just the habits just change. And, and so with programs, it's kind of a little bit of a last vestige of, of certain things, but you know, they're not inexpensive to print. You know, I used to live in the print world and I know especially glossy like that. And they probably print, you know, 
20 or 30,000 of them or who knows, you know, for, for, for a decent run. So, um, the programs also give you, uh, a platform for some other information that, um, I think I have to say one thing that doesn't usually interest me that much is the directors always feel like they have to have a director's letter in there. And I feel sort of the same way about that as, and, and this is a kind of a, maybe a related topic when, when the, People come on stage before the show and blab about this, that, and the other thing. I'm just like, shut up, cut to the chase. You know, I want to see the show. I don't want to see that. You know, and and a lot of a lot of theaters do it. Um, what do you, what do you think of those uh, preliminary announcements before a show? <laughs> I personally always dread. I dread them. I, as someone who has done quite a bit of directing, I always hate when I've been asked by like it's usually by producers or somebody to be like, go out. You have to introduce the show or something. And I always hated it. I did not. I didn't enjoy it. I, I use my director's notes when I've been had when I've had to write them to kind of like thank the audience for showing up and being like, I hope you. But then I kind of just would let rather the show speak for itself. I think a bit more exactly. like what you're saying. Um, um, and any information they have about you know sponsors or upcoming shows or whatever is that's a that's a place for the program to to do it. But it's like it's kind of like have you ever been to a concert where some bozo from the local radio station comes on and starts talking about stuff and you're just like go away you know just start the show. <laughs> no, nothing, uh, you know, I don't want to just on people who, who do come out and, and talk, but uh, I don't know. You'll, you might want to ask yourself how much uh, that's for you or how much it's for the audience. And if it's not really for the audience, you might think twice. Yeah, like I've definitely seen, I think, an exception. Like the one I can definitely see is like opening night when you have everybody there who has made it like right. for for sure. OK, you want to you want to touch base. You want to thank your donors who are showing up and you're supporting this thing that made this investment before you even got into the room i think that's a really that's a good i think that's a pretty good reason if that's like an event and that's a part of it but yeah okay <laughs> i err on the side i will say that you that should be two minutes max uh and and shorter if possible uh it's just don't go on for five minutes keep it concise uh, you're, you're gonna be losing the audience so um all right well that's uh, that's what we had to say about about programs and we'll see uh i, I will mention one last thing so uh one of the more, more fun programs we saw recently was uh at uh, benchmark theater for their blasted show you know the whole thing takes place in a hotel room and so the, the program was like a little like a key card envelope with a with a QR code thing and, and I think it had the cast list on it right it did that was a really fantastic one I I noticed that like um, immersive things or like kind of the more experimental theaters they often have fun with the programs like you're like you're mentioning uh, with that so that's a really good example I, I will say one other thing about programs and, and thinking of that one it was really easy to put in your pocket and so like these big programs it's like you've got it and it's like okay it doesn't I've got to put it under the seat it maybe it's going to disappear or it's one of those glossy ones I'm going to slip on it <laughs> in a uh, or you know I'm sure a lot of people have to you know people at the theater have to pick them up after the show so uh, but that's that's just I don't know there's no there's no real solution for that unless they want to put like you know like in a church as a place for the for the gospels and stuff <laughs> put those in the back of the seats honestly not a bad idea yeah well it, you know the, the drink holders are kind of a newer innovation uh, that everybody appreciated i was about to say put it right next to the cup holder in the theater and and sometimes if you don't have a drink you can roll up your program and stick it in the you know in the drink holder but anyway this is <laughs> probably too far in the weeds so uh, i know uh so last week we talked about all of the holiday shows coming up and Tony, you had the excellent idea to talk about all this non-holiday shows coming up because there are definitely people who would rather have their fingernails pulled out with a pair of pliers than see any kind of holiday show, especially if, you know, if their their religious proclivities or, you know, uh, just don't, they're just not into that stuff. Uh, so uh, what are some of the, and, and there's definitely a fair amount. It's not just like there's only holiday shows out there, even though there are quite a few of them. What, uh, what were some of the suggestions that uh, you would have for, for folks? So I guess I'll, I'll start. I've got two over in the Boulder area that I will just throw out that are uh, playing around the holidays, but they are not holiday shows themselves. So first is uh, The Bell of Amherst by Boulder Ensemble Theater Company. So they just got done uh, with their, this is the remount of a run that they did of this production earlier this year at Buntport. It's about the life of Emily Dickinson. One Woman Show starring Jessica Robley, artistic director over there, uh, and Mark Reagan, who is the producing, uh, the managing director over there. Uh, and yeah, it was a, 
It was really good in Bunport, and it, they've remounted it in Colorado Springs earlier this month, and they're going to be doing it at the Dairy Center uh, November 22nd uh, through the 26th. I know you saw that one uh, over at Bunkport, right? Yeah. So originally it was, you know, Mark had, and Jess had started this Clover and Bee Productions thing before they knew that they were going to be kind of taken over Betsy. And so I think I actually looked for the Clover and Bee website recently and it's down. So I think maybe Clover and Bee has has died and been just, you know, sort of uh, taken over by by Betsy. So, yeah, it's, it's a great show. Uh, and I think, you know, they've remounted it several times just because it's been so popular. Um, and uh, it's and just does a great job with it so yeah and it was cool that they went down and they did it at the Millibo art theater down in colorado springs uh and now it's back uh, at the dairy i'm assuming it's probably in the smaller theater it's in the gordon i know it's in the same space that coal uh, coal country was in that was one of the things that came up in our interview they had to design the lights so that they could immediately do a switch from coal country uh yeah it was one of the things that drew off to uh yeah. Um, so anyway, all right, what else? What else non-holiday should people be thinking about? Uh, one other non-holiday show uh, for those over in the Boulder area is a workshop premiere performance of an original musical, uh, We're Still Here, uh, written by Alex J- Walker Jr. and Cordelia Zars. So this is based on a kind of a true story. Uh, it's based off of the flat, uh, oak flat uh Uh, sacred lands that are in Arizona. And there was a proposed minefield that was going to come there. And Cordelia is a reporter and she went out to investigate this. And she did a bunch of interviews with the people who are from, uh, from the small town who are pro this mining coming in and uh, with the indigenous people who are from the sacred land and who are deeply against this, uh, did this reporting, uh, was like, couldn't get the idea out of her head uh, and came back to Colorado and now is working with uh, an indigenous leader here, Alex Walker Jr., on this original musical that is a fictionalized version of this strike set in Ohio. Uh, about two two people on uh, both sides of the issue, an, indig- an indigenous person and then someone from a mining town and their kind of unlikely friendships and this, that circumstance. Right. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting show that I think our our, our correspondent, Julie Walker, is going to be at that one. Um, and um, what else? I mean, we're, we're going to go through some of these when we do our rundown, but uh, any other real standouts for you? Yeah, I guess I'll kind of we I'll shout these out quickly because we talked more extensively about them in adjacent to holiday. Uh, Roger and Hammerstein Cinderella mentioned it and it's going to be coming up again when I, in our, my conversation with Brian. It's over at the Arvada Center. It's running November 24th through December 31st over there. It's a modern day uh, adaptation of that of that tale. So it's you're going to see Cinderella uh, and her mate with a cell phone, a uh, stepmother with a Chanel bag. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, a, it's it's not going to be like any Cinderella you've ever seen before. Kenny Moten has said that he he's seen this adaptation of Roger and Hammerstein's Cinderella many times before, and he's always felt that the more modern updates that are in the book are fighting against the more traditional setting because it's set in the like fairy tale traditional time. So he's like, but I, what if you just update it? What if you just set it modern in like this modern fairy tale kingdom? And so that's the take. Okay. Well, that'd be really curious to see what that looks like. So, um, well, um, I also should mention that uh, if you're looking for shows in general, we've got a, a big calendar on our website where you can filter either by holiday shows exclusively, or if you just want to look for musicals or comedy or drama, that you can do that too. So you can definitely, uh, you know, there's some overlap in, you know, holiday and comedy and musical and stuff, but uh, it's a good way to find shows too. Yeah. Another overlap. We quickly talked about this one last week too. Candlelight's doing Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It's a musical, but and it's religious e, but it's more about the family and this like super fun music over there. And it just sounds like it's going to be a, a blast over there. So that's running uh, November 24th through January 28th, 2024. So you've got plenty of time to get over there to see that one. Uh, oh. If you another one in Boulder, uh, 
This is not a holiday musical, but you could use the holiday season to go check out uh, BDT's final production, Fiddler on the Roof, which is running uh, over there until January 13th, uh, 2024. So if you haven't gotten to see it, I definitely recommend going out to see that one before. Um, All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, a look around the state at all the live theater coming up in late November and into December, uh, in addition to what we just talked about. So stay tuned. This podcast is brought to you by the Littleton Town Hall Arts Center, presenting Matilda the Musical from November 30th through December 31st. Roald Dahl's trademark dark wit comes to life in this family-friendly musical about a clever little girl with astonishing powers. Matilda's parents send her to an oppressive school run by a cruel headmistress, but there she forges a bond with her kind-hearted teacher, Miss Honey, and the two inspire each other to be courageous and embrace their own power. Packed with high-energy dance numbers, catchy songs, and exciting onstage magic, Matilda the Musical is a perfect holiday show for the whole family. Get tickets at townhallartscenter.org. The Onstage Colorado podcast is sponsored in part by the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Betsy, whose new production of Holly, Alaska features a merry band of community theater players who have been keeping the tradition of an annual holiday pageant alive for 119 years. But due to recent cutbacks, the town council has decided this year's show can happen. So in a last-ditch effort to save the pageant and the town itself, the actors pull out the stops in this heartwarming tale of love, connection, and holiday revelry of the goofiest kind. Holly Alaska runs from December 7th through the 31st at the Dairy Arts Center in Boulder. Get tickets at thedairy.org and learn more about the show at betsy.org. Okay, welcome back to the On Stage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller. I'm here with Tony Tresca, and it's time for our weekly peek into some of the shows you can see on stage right now around Colorado. And of course, we just talked about some of them, uh, but um, I'll mention that a couple of things that we have uh, new reviews of on our site is Camp Christmas is back. And so this is a Denver Center Off Center production. So Off Center is the division of the Denver Center that does shows uh in other places. And uh, um, they've done a number of them over the years. Camp Chris is probably their biggest and most successful. And, you know, uh, and it was, um, it's kind of like being barfed on by, uh, I don't know, Santa and a dozen reindeers. I mean, there's just, you go into the Stanley marketplace in Aurora and you're just overwhelmed with unbelievable. There's all these different installments. It's kind of like meow wolf crashes into the North pole uh, or something like that. (laughs) Yes, I know. Uh, and so originally, so it started in 2019 at the Stan- at Stanley Marketplace, and then the pandemic pushed it outside. So it was at the Lakewood Belmar Heritage Park, I think it's called, for a couple of years. And I think they really wanted to get back indoors because I think... You know, there's it's warmer inside for one thing, and there's more time to to linger and and uh, you know look at all the displays. So uh, you were there uh, the other night. So Tony, what was your take? I was. I I had not been to it in any. This is my first camp Christmas, and so I just got to be fully. It was not. I had seen the ads for it, and so I kind of knew what to expect. But it was really. It was like like you said, like totally being immersed in this winter wonderland. I don't. I don't know how they could have done it outside fully. There was an outdoor section of it this year. And I think that was the section, uh, that was a section that was worked the least for me because they weren't able to fully immerse you when you're inside the Stanley marketplace, every inch is covered in these like little, little tips from Lonnie, who is the designer over there. These little Easter egg merit badge, Mary badges, excuse me, that you're hunting for throughout the exhibit. And just all these like cool little details in there that you just like, I I was outside for a little bit, but I spent most of my time walking inside the Stanley marketplace because it was just so cool inside. Yeah, it really is fun. Uh, And they have those pun trees, uh, uh, so yeah, it's like a little Christmas tree and it might have a bunch of things hanging off of that are some sort of a pun. Uh, and I can't think of an example right now. So, so anyway, so camp Christmas runs through, uh, Christmas Eve, December 24th, a uh, really fun place to take the kids, but they also have adult beverage stations and, uh, hot chocolate and all kinds of stuff, uh, there. And of course the Stanley marketplace is, is a fantastic place to visit. It's got all these different restaurants and uh, cool bar too. So I actually went to, I, I went to 
eat in one of the restaurants before they're one of their Mexican restaurants that they had in this damn new marketplace. It was really good. I, and I was walking after I went and did the camp Christmas. I just kind of walked around the shops. It's a, you can make a full evening out of it. It's a really cool place to host it. Uh, another review we just had up uh, from our correspondent, Susan Harper was letters of Suresh at the curious theater. Um, I know you said you were kind of a little mixed on that one. She loved it. She called it an elegant exploration of character. Um, they had a little, hiccup this weekend i think i don't know if it was COVID or something but they canceled the weekend's shows because of something i don't know what but uh, hopefully that will be back uh next weekend so uh also the odd couple at uh, firehouse theater starts up on november 18th and i am looking forward to being at that one tonight i was about to say i know that you have plans to see that one this evening uh, yes for sure I, we were talking about it last night. Now I've not seen a ton of Neil Simon, Neil Simon, but uh, you, you're, you have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. Uh, I've, uh, I've 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 done a Neil Simon show or two back in when I used to act. Uh, Rumors was one, but uh, I also remember when I was in high school. Um, I my this was up in Summit County, and my my drama teacher was a woman named Wendy Moore, who many people know in Colorado because she was a, a really well known director, and of course her her husband is a, a Bob is. A, is a really well-known actor and, and the kids are really uh, um, successful in, in theater and dance and all this. And, and uh, But anyway, uh, we were doing a, a scene study in the classroom for The Odd Couple and I pulled out, a, I was playing Oscar and I pulled out a cigar and lit it uh, in the classroom. So this would have, this was a very long time ago when, you know, of course now I probably would have been arrested and, uh, you know, <laughs> their SWAT team would have come in, you know, uh, but Wendy like, let it go on. And after the show, she's like, please don't ever do that again. Um, so anyway, but you know, the odd couple is kind of like this, this, uh, seminal New York comedy, uh, by Neil Simon from the sixties about two guys who, uh, you know, uh, are very different, and it was spun off into a very successful, long-running TV show with uh, with Tony Randall and Jack Klugman. So, uh, and this one has an interracial cast, and I think they're taking a little bit of a different approach to it. So, looking forward to seeing that. Uh, we talked about. Rogers and Hammerstein Cinderella is at the Arvada Center. Um, Annie will be at the big uh, at the Buell a touring Broadway show from the 21st to the 26th of November. You mentioned Jason at Candlelight, and we're we're still here. Um, and uh, also on stage now uh, or opening soon are so last week we talked about the Little Prince. So this is a theater works production at the Ent Center in Colorado Springs, and we were wondering like uh, I didn't wasn't familiar with the story. I'm just going to read the first line of, of the Wikipedia entry on The Little Prince because I was really fascinated by it. So The Little Prince is a novella written and illustrated by French aristocrat, writer, and military pilot Antoine de saint Excupay, I think, maybe. It was first published in English and French in the U.S. in April of 1943, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was, and it's about this uh, this little kid from another planet, and it's got something that's going on in the Sahara Desert, and uh, it's, I don't know, it sounds like a really interesting story. So, uh, And this one's being done with puppetry uh, and other things. So if you're in the Springs or... Going to the Springs sounds like that one would be, be a fun one to go to. And I, I think it's 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 for kids, but also for adults as well. That does sound, that actually sounds really sick. I'm a big fan of puppets, so. <laughs> yeah, I know you, I know you dig puppets, so. Um, and then uh, at Iron Springs Chateau, also down that way in Manitou Springs, uh, they have they have one of their dinner, dinner theater wacky uh you know, shows called Miracle in Mistletoe. Uh, although I was checking their website and their site is down. So I, I think that show is still going on, uh, but the, their site is messed up. So um, Act a Lady at Bob Blue up in Fort Collins from November 24th through December 17th. And this one is kind of a look like kind of a wacky drag comedy of some sort uh, that uh, I'd love to get up and see it. It's just God, it's, it's two hours to get up there. You know, it's like, um, it's, it's a little bit of a haul, but uh, Bob Blue is a really great, great theater up there uh, if you haven't been. Yeah, they do. They do really good work. It's up for, in Fort Collins and small, small, intimate space. But well, they choose really interesting titles, I've noticed. Yeah. Uh, and so Wendy Ishii, who started that, uh, you know, back in the 90s, it was originally she was all about like Beckett and like, you know, the French existentialists. And that was like, kind of, that was her wheelhouse. Uh, and then, you know, they since expanded because you can only fill so many seats with that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, all right. Well, Tony, this is the time when you pull out of your pocket some other things that we haven't talked about yet. What have you got uh, this week? I, I'll, I'm just going to do 
two on the horizon for folks who are doing some planning uh, and want to do want to get some tickets for something early in December, right after you get done with all the Thanksgiving stuff. So I'll shout out Matilda, which is going to be going the musical going on at Town Hall Art Center, running December first through the thirty first. Uh, it, it's based on the Roald Dahl book. It's a delightful musical. It's gonna it's a, a big cast with a bunch of kids kids and adults it's going to be a good time over there i don't if you've never seen matilda on stage before i can't recommend it enough it's a great show it really is great kids love it because it's it's a little darker it's not just like you know fluff it's it's and kids like darker yeah, stuff like the, you know? the chokey and like when the with trunchbull like throws the kids you, you know it's a there, there's some darker elements. It's real. It keeps it keeps it real. Yeah, some really mean, mean, mean adults, you know. Uh, and the other one, in a totally different vein, uh, a little bit lighter, I sub- I maybe say, uh, is Six over at the Denver Center. This is the touring production uh, of that. It's going to be. It's a nice long run over at the Denver Center. It'll be there de- uh, December fifth through the twenty. 20- Fourth, and this is about the six wives of Henry the Eighth, uh, to who are telling their story. Uh, they each kind of, it's kind of like a pop concert. They're all based on different pop stars uh, throughout the ages, and like Adele uh, to and uh, Rihanna and different and, and Beyonce and different pop stars like that. Uh, and it just if you haven't heard the music, it's super catchy and it will get stuck in your head for days. So be warned all right yeah i'm really looking forward to that one i know it was it was a big hit on on broadway so i'm glad to see that's coming here all right well hang on for just a second uh we're gonna have a short break and then tony's interview with brian mulgrave from the arvada center so stick around hey brian how's it going hi there how, how are you doing <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm just, I'm really thrilled to be chatting with you today as part of the Onstage Colorado's ongoing series where we take listeners behind the scenes of technical teams who make theater possible. And my guest today is entering his 17th season as Director of Scenic Design at the Arvada Center for the Arts and Humanities and is the 2023 Henry Award winner for his work designing the Arvada Center's holiday show, Beauty and the Beast, directed by Kenny Moten, the fabulous Brian Malgrave. <laughs> Hi there. Yes. So I, over the years, your 17 seasons, uh, I, you've designed uh, quite a few sets. I have, you know, um, I think I did actually a count not too long ago and it was just a little over 200. Wow. So, um, and that's at the the center alone. So, yeah, I've had a lot of time and experience working on both of those stages, which has just been great. And I guess, yeah, we should say as well, you are the resident scenic designer at the center, but you also work all across the state of Colorado. So I do. I'm lucky enough to get some, um, you know, respites in some other theater locations and do some other um, really fun, uh, uh, exciting jobs as well. So when you kind of get assigned a project or join the t- a creative team what are kind of the initial steps of your creative process as you undertake a set design well um i'm first of all i'm i'm so fortunate that i get to work on so many varieties of shows whether they're plays or musicals but absolutely it starts out with reading that script um probably three or four times uh, mostly i just kind of do a first pass just to kind of um sort of find out what everything's all about and just for pleasure and just kind of be entertained. Um, and then my second couple of passes start uh, getting uh, hardcore into uh, taking some notes and starting to create some real lists. And then, of course, if it's a musical, it's a little bit of a different beast where um, I'm also listening to the soundtrack quite often. Do you kind of have any like sources of inspiration that you find yourself frequently drawing on or other scenic designers that you really admire? You know, I do um, uh, love Scott Pask. I love his design and um, I often kind of keep abreast of what's going on on Broadway stages with, um, you know, uh, really wonderful designers like like him. Um, uh, And then also I just kind of it it really depends on what that actual situation is going to be and where it drives me to start getting inspiration from. Um, I think one of the things I love the most about what I do is that in each and every project, I learn so much about something 
completely and totally new for each show. And so that's part of, I think, why I love this so much. It's constantly changing and there's such variety. I I know you were just recently uh, in New York. Did you happen to have a favorite set, set design from your recent trip or a show you saw? Absolutely. I think the, the production of Sweeney Todd was probably the most amazing that I've seen in a really long period of time. And actually that designer uh, worked really um, uh, intelligently, I think, with creating a very, very minimal set that was basically a bridge that raised and lowered. But whenever you went into interiors, there weren't really walls or like realistic elements. And the way that they staged it and used, uh, uh, for example, uh, they created like a window out of a railing. It was just so ingenious and so lovely and seamless and worked really well with that style of that show. Well, that's honestly, that's a brilliant segue to my next question. I was going to speak to the collaborative process that makes theater happen. So at your work as a scenic designer has to fit into the larger world that other creatives, actors, directors are going to inhabit. So what is it kind of like to collaborate in that fashion with other members of the creative team? And what have been some of your recent favorite uh, productions you've collaborated on around the state of Colorado? Um, uh, I think uh, working with other designers is one of the most gratifying elements of what we do, just because we get, you know, different um, facets of, of other people's ideas and what they're going to bring to a process on their own. Um, I always say that uh, working in theater is, is the ultimate in teamwork, just because um, it is being able to collaborate or compromise or change or be completely and utterly flexible, just so that you can kind of like put all of the ducks in the row and sort of like hit all all of the nails on the head in terms of being able to cover all the bases and get kind of all the information in there um, when you're looking at a design. So um, uh, I love that part of my job. Uh, there's a lot of scheduled meetings that help out with that as a group. Um, and then outside of that, there are a ton of sidebars that we have, you know, like like maybe I'll have a sidebar with the lighting designer about a specific um, process or specific in instruments that the lighting designer wants to use. Um, so I think just that um, complete series series of meetings and getting all of that information that we need and then being able to kind of like process that and put it all together. That's kind of um, uh, that's kind of the ultimate in teamwork. Right. So the other thing that I think I love about um, working with others, uh, especially when I'm able to work with them more than one one time is I kind of get to know them from kind of like a psychological standpoint or perspective. And that gives me ideas about what their biggest strengths are, you know, and so so when I start to work with them again, I'm a big person in terms of like supporting and helping and being able to um, design around uh, particular artist strengths so that we're all seen in like our our, our biggest glories, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, circle, any recent productions that where you feel like the collaboration has just really come together? Absolutely. I would say um uh, one of the craziest shows that I did recently was beautiful at the Arvada Center. And I'll tell you the reason why. Yeah, it there are, uh, I think there are 22 scenes in the first act alone. And we're dealing with a situation where there are tons of interiors, but there are also tons of like concert-esque settings and how to do that and how to make it a seamless show where, you know, we weren't really waiting for um, uh, set pieces to come in and out or, or the scenes to change. Um, that took a lot of collaboration collaborative effort uh, in talking through beats, moments, the musicality of the, the different pieces, the transitional material that we had to work with while things were shifting. And um, that was a, a, a big feat. And I was really proud of, I think that worked out really, really well. I remember saying to Alex Miller on the podcast after seeing Beautiful at the Center, I remember saying that the scenic design felt like another character because of how much it was involved in telling the story. So I would definitely agree. <laughs> That's great. And that was one of the first times I think we were able to really go outside of our box in terms of a lot of the formulas that we have to work with, with our mechanical equipment or the tracks that we're able to create in the stage flooring and such. And so I felt like it was just really successful and very unique and different. 
Yeah, and I, I just loved how you, ne- as an audience member, you never kind of could predict where something was going to fly out of, where a new scenic element was going to, which person was going to come from the, a different level. It was really just invigorating to watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, you know, when you're talking about, like, um, the conceptual nature of a show like that, um, a lot of times uh, the Broadway and, and touring productions were so incredibly popular that I don't want to, like, copy off of any of that when we go in and create our own original design. So um, that design in particular was very much based on a uh, 1965 console record player. So all of the wood veneer and the kind of the the googie architecture and stuff that was intertwined with all of that just really hit the nail on the head in terms of period, um, the different periods that the show goes through. And so that whole show was based in that idea. Did you have any others you wanted to spot like before we moved on? It's also that was also a really great answer for that question, too. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, some other how about some other favorite recent productions. Um, you know, you talked a little about Beauty and the Beast. Um, I always tell people people ask me a lot, like what my favorite production is ever. And usually I tell them it's the one I'm working on at the time. And the reason for that is, you know, I've I've done a lot of repeat shows and I've done a lot of uh, shows that, you know, I read the script and I wasn't that excited about it first. Um, but I think one of the challenges for me is to create a way for me to get my head inside of the script and to get excited about it, especially if it's something that I've done several times already. But those shows often turn out to be um, some of the most exciting for me because I get more creative. Um, so I think Beauty and the Beast was a really wonderful example of that. Um, just the sheer volume of, of what it takes to do the show alone and being able to do that at our VADA with our resources um, and the, you know, amazing scenic paint that we have there. Um, we, I think we were, we created a really beautiful production. Um, one of the other things I'm thinking of right now is um, Into the Woods. Uh, Norm, we did that in an incredibly different style and a different way than what the script really calls for. And um, being able to work with Lynn Collins, who will, you know, kind of give permission to do some crazier things or come up with some crazier ideas is so incredibly fun because I think we made that production our own completely. And, you know, having it kind of take place and and sort of blossom from a nursery room um, was really kind of incredible. And then that, you know, opened up so many doors, getting to collaborate with um, the lighting designer for that particular show and um, the costumer and all the other folks on the creative team to make that what it was. So te- technology is always constantly is of constantly evolving. Uh, and I wonder how has it kind of affected your work at all? Do you inc- have you inc- found yourself incorporating any digital tools or new kind of softwares as you approach it? Or are you kind of not in that realm at all? <laughs> It's interesting that you ask that because I'm kind of an anomaly. Um, I was trained in acting and then I started taking design courses. So really the design part of my education wasn't as focused as the acting part. Um, So uh, I didn't kind of take more accelerated classes in terms of scenic design. What I was into at the time during my education was um, the basics. And so I learned how to hand draft and then I learned how to, you know, kind of express myself in different ways or communicate through drawing. And that's something that I've never let go of. And it's very, very different than how most people um, approach scenic design today. And so um, I've taken uh, or I have the tools that I need if I want to, you know, use like computer-aided drafting. But um, most of the people that I work with with actually prefer that I continue to hand draft because there's an amount of detail or an amount of emotion that you can't really get out of like a computer program. And when I'm able to put that into my work, I think people really appreciate that that kind of communicates something very specific or very unique. And so, um, for example, the um, tech director that I work with at the Arvada Center is just absolutely brilliant. And I enjoy drawing everything old school like that because it helps me learn and understand about every single inch of where everything's going to be on stage. And I think he's very similar. So he takes my work and he scans it and and puts it into his um, computer programs so that he can actually trace it and also understand every single inch of where every, every, you know, everything is on stage. So in that respect, I'm pretty old school, which I think is kind of, you know, a benefit um, in some ways. Um, 
Um, but the things I do have to learn in terms of like advancing technology are things like how new lighting systems can integrate into a design. So, for example, there are so many newer, wonderful instruments that have like LED capability. And um, those instruments don't require as much of a throw when you're trying to light something like, say, like a drop. So normally, just to give you like some technical information, um, if we have like these um, uh elements that are lighting a psych like old school elements you'd need like four feet of space up from up above to be able to light that well nowadays with these new um uh led uh strip uh, uh lighting uh, equipment um pieces we're able to get those as close as like four inches so you can imagine that changes immensely what i'm able to do up in the air in terms of the um scenic elements that are going to be in and around those type of of lighting instruments so learning about that just as technology continues to advance or um, newer sound equipment or newer um, materials to work with in terms of scenic stuff um, there's a new uh uh kind of a scrim material and it's called chameleon cloth and it essentially kind of looks like a dryer sheet but um you know, and they come in all kinds of different color um, palettes and things like that. But being able to work with like a newer technology like that will get such a different um, kind of effect than we're able to get from like the older school materials like a scrim. And so just keeping abreast of that kind of things and also seeing a lot of newer productions and some of the materials and, and um, bits and pieces of scenic elements that they're working with is always super inspiring and helpful in terms of, you know, just continuing to grow on that path. So scenic design kind of as a whole, you're working, we have already spoken to like this collaborative nature. You're talking about the integration of the lighting and how balancing those effects. There's kind of a, always this tension between practicality and the aesthetical purposes. How do you approach the kind of challenge or the kind of fun of creating a sets that not only have to be very visually striking, but also functional for performers to be on? Well, I always tell everybody, everybody uh, asks me about, you know, how did you come up with that idea? And it's um, first of all, never my idea completely. So, you know, I can take responsibility for only so much, but sometimes the script is going to demand so much that is specific or a, a certain director might have an idea already um, in terms of how they want to approach something. So it's always, you know, a collaboration in that respect. But really, we're always dealing with storytelling and those, um, you know, the key people that are telling the story are the are the actors. And so um Many, many times something that an actor is doing really needs to be integrated into the um, uh, uh, kind of the, the composition or the perspective of what's going on with a set piece or a set design that's in and around them. So they are always kind of number one. Um, I'll give you a really great example for... Um, beautiful actually we had that uh, spinet and we uh, created a system with the spinet so that the the spinet bench was hooked up and welded to it um, kind of discreetly with flat steel pieces and such and so in order to get that to work well we had I think you know six different people that used the spinet and so we actually had to do um, a separate fitting during the rehearsal process for each actor that was going to be utilizing that so that we knew where exactly was the sweet spot to sit the bench before we welded it so that everybody could kind of feel comfortable. And then as folks moved that around from scene to scene, it worked really well for whoever needed to use it. So that kind of stuff is just basically ongoing. And there's a lot of times where um, I'm fortunate enough to be at the Arvada Center, like during a rehearsal and they'll pull me in and then we'll talk through some of the mechanics or some of the technical things that are going to be happen happening in and around um, the cast and then we're able to kind of you know do a fitting or you know um, kind of understand what we need to do as far as progressing with the design so that it uh, supports all of those elements that's really quite common thank you so much for kind of taking us behind the scenes into how the scenes get made so my kind of my final question for you uh, is 
what are three shows that you haven't designed and don't currently have plans to design that you would like to work on? Oh, that's a great question. Um, like I said, I've done a, a ton, you know, that I, I never expected to be working on or, or new shows that I, I haven't seen before that we can make our own original ideas. But um, uh, one of the shows that was really inspiring to me that uh, I think I saw it in seventh grade. It was the first Broadway show that I'd ever seen. And it really made me want to do this. It made me want to dive deeper into theater and find out what it was all about. And that was uh, 42nd Street. Mm. I think it was like 1987 and it was on Broadway. And I remember every single element of what I saw and how things moved and even the expression of the actors' faces, you know, um, uh, it was just uh, such an incredible experience. And I think it would be really fun someday to revisit that uh, kind of beast of a show and be able to put my own spin on it. Um, I also really enjoy kind of smaller sort of awkward pieces. Um, there's a show that's called K2. And I believe it's based on like the name of a mountain, but um, I believe uh, uh, two climbers are stranded on the side of a, a snowy mountain while, while they're climbing and doing something like that in a smaller space and creating an entire, you know, uh, elevation that's about, you know, uh, uh, some organic kind of frozen um, uh, side of a mountain, I think would be a blast to work on. Yeah, it sounds like a real challenge, too, just to that, but it would be very cool. Absolutely. Yeah, just in terms of finding materials that work and fit and sculpting something like that and the process that goes into all of that, it'd just be really exciting. Um, um, my favorite play is actually uh, The Glass Menagerie from uh, 1944. It's Tennessee Williams. And um, I've always just been completely and totally infatuated with that. And I know I've seen uh, many iterations of it. I would love to put my own spin on that and kind of capture some of the delicacy and the the humanity in that um, that show. I think it would be just thrilling to actually get to realize that. So someday I hope to do that as well. Well, directors, you, you've heard Brian's picks. Uh, so <laughs> if you're working on any of those shows anytime soon, hit him up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian, for taking the time to chat with me today. This has been just an absolutely delightful conversation. Oh, my pleasure. And you can see his work uh, at the Arvada Center next. Uh, it will be Roger and Hammerstein's Cinderella running November 24th through December 31st. Any little teases about uh, the scenic design? I've seen the pictures floating around on social media and it just looks gorgeous. Absolutely. This is a blast of a show because um, we were actually um, uh, kind of guided to not make it anything like anybody has ever seen before. And so we've got some wonderful uh, uh, spins on everything from the carriage to the palace to how the set moves. And um, the all important uh, approaching midnight is a very big theme in um, a lot of our uh, design elements. So I'm super excited about this one and I can't wait to, to share it with everybody. I cannot wait to check that one out. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great rest of your day. You too, Mel. Thanks so much. All right, that's it for this week's episode. Uh, Tony, thanks for helping uh, go through all those non-holiday shows and all the other shows. Yeah, that was a that was a great conversation. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much to Brian Mulgrave for coming on to talk about uh, the scene design at, from the Armada Center, and uh, for you, uh, Tony, for for running through all this stuff. So uh, next week uh, we'll have Rachel Finley. So we were talking about uh, the Odd Couple. So uh, they had, the Firehouse Theater Company had posted a little video online showing Rachel Finley from Rachel's Costume Shop, kind of talking about the costumes for the show. Um, and uh, so I got in touch with her because we hadn't really had a, a costume designer on the show and she's a really fascinating uh, young woman who was started out as an actor and just kind of you know knew how to sew and just got really interested in the costume side of things and does a lot of costumes for a number of theaters around here so great conversation next week with her more great stuff coming up next week if you haven't already please subscribe to the on stage colorado podcast wherever you get your audio stuff and uh, give us a review or a couple of stars if you're enjoying this program and please if you know other theater lovers uh, let us know let them know about the podcast uh, it's it's a little hard you know at tony's you know there's a lot of podcasts out there and uh, but this one uh, is uh, i would have to say is completely unique there's no other podcast on a weekly basis in college that's exclusively devoted to theater in colorado so people should listen to it right tony 
Absolutely. If you're if you love theater or you know somebody who loves theater, you guys should be listening. Listen together. Disagree with us. Write in. We'd love to. We'd love to. Would you want to come on the show? We'd love to have you. Yeah. Well, um, if you're a theater person, you know, not if you're just like, you know, some random guy. Yeah. But, you know, the people that had the people, uh, you know, who uh, have listened to it have, have come up to me and, and maybe you've heard this too, but they're like, wow, this is great. You know, it's like, uh, uh, it's really fun to listen to, you know, the different topics that you guys come up with and, and hear about, you know, uh, just kind of a, a roundup of what's going on in theater. All right, I'm Alex Miller. I'm Tony Tresca. And we'll we'll see see you at at the show. show. Is that too corny? I don't know. (laughs) If it's it's too corny with both of us, you can just use your audio and just end it like...